you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn to the book of Acts? The book of Acts, we're going to be reading in Acts chapter 20, and uh, we will begin in verse 17 and finish right around verse 35. So as you're turning there, you know, to say that the years between 1987 and 1990 were pivotal for me would really be an understatement. In fact, uh, it was during those three years of my life that I experienced uh, more transition and more blessing than maybe any period in my life. Um, in the fall of 1987, I left Appomattox, Virginia, heading west to Fort Worth, Texas, only knowing one person there, a guy I had worked with for two or three months in ministry. And uh, so I arrived in Fort Worth, Texas, realized everybody in Texas had to have air conditioned. We were staying in the home of a guy who was away for the weekend doing ministry. He said, yeah, you can, he, he knew my buddy, yeah, you can use the house. And um, it was in a rough part of town. So we didn't really leave the windows open and we didn't realize that uh, he had air conditioned. We couldn't find the thermostat. We suffered all night. But that wasn't in Omen because things really began to pick up because I'd only been there a week and I met this girl. Her name was Karen Jones and we were, we were an item pretty soon. And uh, at that time, I had that Central Virginia oat in a boat. I'm sort of not doing that anymore. And she was light and right. And so people were probably wondering if we were from another country, but we met in, in 87. 1988, once I got settled in seminary that fall, I was able to get really what I would say the first job that I got on my own. And by that, I mean I'd worked at the hardware in my hometown that my great uncle owned. I'd worked in clothing retail with a guy that was in the church. I worked green front furniture for a couple of years, but only the connection of being a Hampton Sydney student, I was able to get that job. But I actually went out and got a job on my own selling and stocking used furniture in really a rough part of town. Uh, but it was a good experience. And then in 1989, Karen and I were married in March of that year. And uh, as things moved to 1990, Things were just continuing to be a blessing. I graduated from seminary. Our oldest son, uh, Wilson, was born two weeks after that. And then two months later, we began to move. And within six months, we were here uh, in Buckingham County. But I was thinking, three years, it was so long ago, but that period of my life seemed to go by so fast. It was like a whirlwind. And you know, as we look back at the last three years, and Carol just mentioned uh, COVID, and uh, you know, that's just been four years ago. In some ways, it seems like it's been so, uh, so soon. It hadn't been that long, and others maybe it seems to be longer. Our granddaughter will turn four uh, in late June, and it seems like uh, just yesterday she was born. You know, we've been looking at Paul's ministry in Ephesus in these last few weeks, and, and he had a blessed ministry in Ephesus. The study began really last month, and, and Paul was sharing the gospel with people. He had great fervor. He had great intentions. He faced adversity as he faced everywhere. And now in the middle of Acts chapter 20, we see that he is bidding farewell to the leaders there. And, and it's a sweet and yet a sad farewell for him and these leaders of the church. But for us today, as we read in just a moment, I believe there are things that we can glean from the, this last example or these examples Paul was giving in exhortation uh, to those believers we can apply to our lives. So look with me at Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 17. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and summoned the elders of the church there. When they came to him, he said to them, you know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and during the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. You know that I did not hesitate to proclaim anything to you that was profitable and to teach you publicly and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God 
in faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there, except that in every town, the Holy Spirit warns me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure, to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each of you with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself and those who are with me. In every way, I've shown you that it is necessary to help the weak by laboring like this and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus because he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let's pray. Father, as we look at the close of Paul's ministry, the church of Ephesus and Lord, how he met the elders, not there in the city, but in the place known as Miletus. I, I pray as we open your word today and we look at the example of Paul's life and we consider the final exhortation that he gives to the elders there that we would apply the truths to, to our hearts and that, Lord, you would be glorified through it. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, I said how quickly it seemed that Paul's ministry went, but I'll be honest, these last couple of weeks of study, it seems like it's sort of gone slowly. Uh, uh, as many of you know, Karen is from uh, East Tennessee, and uh, quite often she and I will travel to her hometown, and it seems like when we get to Knoxville, it goes like a, a whirl. I mean, things really go fast, but as you, if you've ever been on uh, Interstate 40, you'll know what I say. It seems like from East Knoxville to West Knoxville is an eternity. It must be 25 miles. And so we push through, we push through, then we get toward the end and things slow down. And that's what happens in Luke's account here in Acts. We've seen the summary of Paul's ministry and all he's gone through and, and a lot was happening in those three years time. But then it seems like these last few weeks that things have really slowed down as we look at Paul's close of his ministry here uh, to the Ephesians. And the close actually, as I just prayed, didn't happen in Ephesus itself. He actually uh, was on a mission. He was set on a task. And so uh, he had to call the elders to meet them um, in a direct line of, of where he was heading. And so we see an emotional farewell here, but there are also some other things that we're going to consider this morning. So I want to look today at Paul's example as a minister. He had lived three years among the Ephesians, and he uses his life as a reference of Christ's likeness, his life as a reference of what's important. And then included in that is not just his example, but his exhortation. And we'll see one specific thing that he warns the elders of the church there that's important in every age of the church and especially today that we be aware of. Well, the first thing I want to look at is Paul's example as a minister. And we see that in, in, in verses 17 and following and then verses 32 through 35. And the first thing you're saying is, oh, no, Rick, we're going back again. Last week we looked and he was sort of closing out what he thought it was his ministry there. He was talking with them and he shared about his life. He, we looked at how it was important to him that he be surrounded by fellow believers, that yes, he had a public ministry, but there were a few small people, a group of people that surrounded him, that he encouraged and that encouraged him. 
But we also looked at the importance of the public ministry, how Paul, throughout all of his first, second, and third missionary journeys, uh, would go into the synagogue. And that was the place like the church would be today, uh, a time where regularly people would come together for the corporate gathering. We talked about the example of him uh, considering important the corporate gathering uh, of believers. And, and we also looked at how he was empowered by God. Uh, that young man fell asleep, Eutychus. You remember from last week, he fell uh, three stories and Paul raised him up. And we talked about how Paul, while we may not work those miracles in our lives, we have the same power of the Holy Spirit in us who is enabling us to work powerful things. So when people see us at the workplace, they'll say there's something different about that person. And then finally, we look at how Paul prioritized the task, and we see it even today in this. Uh, Paul would not be deterred from going to Jerusalem. As you remember in our study over the weeks, he had collected offerings from uh, the Macedonians and the Achaeans. He had gone to them, Christians, many of which were Gentiles. And he said, let's support the Jewish Christians. It will be an encouragement to them was the mindset, but also a witness to Jews who would have yet to believe. And so Paul was laser focused. He wasn't going to be distracted from that. In fact, that's why he's not in Ephesus now. He was in Miletus because that was more a direct line for him. So we saw these virtues last week. He, he, he understood the importance of fellowship. He prioritized the task. He realized that God's power was necessary in his life. But we're going to see four other things today uh, as we look at these virtues. And the first thing we see is Paul served with all humility. He served with all humility. He says that of himself uh, as he sum summoned uh, the elders there in Miletus. In verse 18, he says, you know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, Ephesus was in Asia. It was a city in Asia. How I was with you the whole time, he said, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears. He put all of himself into it. And during the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews, Paul said, I'm just a man, and I served humbly here. I, I didn't have all of the successes some of these star uh, uh, preachers might have. I went through difficulties. You saw me as I was a man who suffered. Now, a superficial reading of this, you would say, well, Paul said that he served with all humility. He's bragging about himself. How can you be humble if you boast about himself? But that's not really what Paul is doing here. Paul was humble. He is, he's trying to do this. He's saying, I'm setting my life as an example for you, how to serve. Now, the book of Colossians in chapter 2 speaks of a false humility. There can be a false humility. You know, someone can be filled with conceit and say, all shucks, and appear outwardly to be humble. But how did Paul demonstrate his humility? He demonstrated his humility by elevating the Lord Jesus Christ because we see he came to preach about God faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever uh, any praise was given toward him by people who were unknowing, he would deflect that and point it to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also served humbly. He, he mentioned how he worked. He didn't presume that, oh, I'm, I'm the pastor and I'm the real deal here and everybody must bow the knee to me and I must have the prime places and I must be esteemed. No, he said, when I was with you, I served you. And he followed the example of Jesus Christ. Remember in John chapter 13, when Jesus was with the disciples right before his death, he got down on his knees and he took a towel and he began to wipe the disciples' feet. Now, in, in our world today, we don't understand the significance of that, but in that world, you would, tr you would totally abase yourself in doing that. It, it would be the most humbling thing you could do. It was considered to be a menial task, not for a person of position. Yet Jesus was Lord and he got on his knees and he wiped the disciples' feet. You see, Paul is talking about his life here. He says, I'm serving with humility. Listen, you cannot come into the kingdom of God apart from humility. You cannot be saved. The only way a person can be saved is, say, is to say this and mean it in the heart. God, I am a sinner. I don't have anything to bring to you. I need what you can give to me. 
And, and so in repentance and in faith, that's an act of humility. And so Paul is saying it's not only something that when we come into the kingdom we're to possess, but it is to mark the Christian life. We're always understanding who God is and who we are and understanding how great he is. In Luke 17, 10, Jesus said, when you've done all that you've been commanded, you should say, we're unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. That was the attitude of Paul. Humility, humility. But I want you to see a, a second truth about Paul's ministry because Paul is saying, hey, I've lived with you three years. You've seen this, leaders. You've seen this, elders. That this is the, what I've tried to model to you that Christ himself has modeled to me. And the, and the second thing, Paul served with no regrets. You know, I was reading an article this past week. Uh, it was written in 2017 by a man named Kyle B. Hart, and he listed 20 frequent deathbed regrets. Now, I don't, won't take the time to share all of them because we're getting ready to eat, and we're going to have some good food here in a little bit. But I do want to share a handful of them. What are most, the most regrets that people have on their deathbed? Number one, I wish I had taken action and dove in head first. I wish I had not waited to start that thing tomorrow. I wish I had told others how much I loved them. I wish I had been content with what I had. I wish I had not held that grudge. And then there's this one. I wish I would have kept going. Someone in the deathbed, I wish I would have kept going. Listen, Paul had no regrets because he kept going. The, the, the division that happened within the mission team, a lot of people would have packed it in and said, oh man, this thing hadn't gone right. No, he kept to the task, even though he and Barnabas parted ways after the first journey. All of the adversity that he faced, the threats from the Jews, the threats on his life, Christians and unbelievers alike warning him that you're treading in dangerous water, he continued to move forward. You know, a lot of people have regrets because they didn't keep going. I wish I had done this when I was younger. I wish I would have kept with that task, with this educational opportunity, with this job. And, and Paul is looking here and he says, I have none of those regrets. In fact, in verse 20 and in verse 27, he repeats it in verse 27. He says, when I was among you, I did not shrink back from anything for fear. Paul <clears throat> had no regrets, no regrets over his life. Now it's important to understand the context here. <clears throat> Look at verse 25. Paul says something that's very personal. He's speaking to the Ephesian elders and he says, and now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. So in context here, Paul is saying, I will never see you again and it's understood, I will never see those under your leadership in Ephesus again. And so basically what he's saying here, I had a three-year window of opportunity. And now it's gone. I won't see you again. But I have no regrets because I didn't hold back preaching the truth. I didn't hold back working in, the, in, in spite of the adversity. In fact, in verse 26, he says, Therefore I declare to you this day, at the end of his window of ministry, I am innocent of all blood, of the blood of all of you. It's sort of like in Ezekiel 33, the watchman, and, and how uh, the prophet said, for the one who sees and warns and people don't, Listen, then their blood is on their own hands. But if the watchman is told and sees it and does not announce it, then, then that person will die, but the blood will be on the hands of the watchman because he did not do what he was supposed to do. Paul said, I was that watchman who did what he was supposed to do. He said, I did not hesitate, verse 27, to declare to you the whole plan of God. There's an important note here. For us, as we look at applying this to our lives, Paul was not perfect. Sometimes we'll look and we'll say, well, that was Paul. I can't be that way. But we see Paul's imperfections. We saw the conflict that he had with Barnabas. But there is one thing that is very important in regard to Paul is this. He didn't do everything people expected him to do. 
He did what God called him to do. If he had done what people expected him to do in his ministry, then he wouldn't have been in Miletus. He would have been in Ephesus because there was much pressure for him to go there. But Paul realized that God was the one who was orchestrating his life. Do you understand that today, that God is directing your life, that God has given you a ministry, that God has given you a task. He is Lord, you're not. And when he calls you, would it be that at the end of whatever ministry that is that God's called you, you could say like Paul, I have no regrets. I didn't shrink back. And so he worked with all humility. He worked uh, with no regrets. And the third thing, he served with no regard for himself. That's how he served. He wasn't thinking about himself. You know, I'm looking forward to the uh, pig picking this uh, weekend. And not only are we going to have good food, which is always great, but I always enjoy seeing the kids with the activities. Now, I was going to share what that new contraption was, but I realized Mike is hiding it. I have inside knowledge. I will not include that. You have to show up to be there. But there's going to be something new for the kids, so invite the kids to come out. And that's going to be next Saturday at 3.30. Their activities will start. One thing I love doing is seeing that barrel train that we have each year that, that goes around. And sometimes we don't do that in the spring. Maybe we will. We're not. I'm not sure. But in the fall, we would always do the barrel train because we have the trunk or treat and all of that. And one of the fun things I love is to see the ladies that like to show off and prove they can still get in the barrel train. <laughs> and they're like that lady who... Uh, can still fit in her wedding dress some 35 years later, you know, that kind of thing. But there's one thing that's true about that barrel train. It's not very big. You might can have an older child with a younger child in the lap, but you cannot have two older children in it. There's not enough room. And so I'll see two older children try to get in it and the rest of the cars are filled. And then they're told by the conductor, you both can't be in here. And one sadly has to sit to the side. Paul realized in his life there wasn't enough space for him to dictate his life and God to dictate his life. And he chose very early that God would control his life. Now, right now, either God is directing your life or you are directing your life. And it can change. It can change in a moment. You can be saved today, but honestly say, you know, these last few months, I've been doing what I want to do, really not what God's called me to do. It could be that you have recently become a follower of Christ and you could say, hey, I used to uh, have that seat myself, but I've yielded it to the Lord. Paul could confidently say God was ruling his life. Remember, Paul was headed to Jerusalem. He was making a direct path toward that. Everyone, everyone was telling him, you're going to get in trouble when you go there. You're going to face afflictions. That word afflictions in the original language carries the idea of a pressing in. It's like if you're watching a movie and a wall is pressing in on somebody and you're, you're hoping they can get out of it. Or there's a, a, a escape door or something before it happens. Paul says that, that bonds, that, that, that chains, that afflictions, they waited him. And it wasn't just people who were trying to scare them. The Holy Spirit was speaking to him and saying, these things are awaiting you. And many of us, we would say, okay, the Holy Spirit has spoken to me. I'm going to avoid Jerusalem. But Paul didn't. Why is that? Because he didn't value his own life greater than he valued finishing the course that God had given him. That's what it says in, in verse 24. He can said, I consider my life of no value to myself. My purpose is to finish my course in the ministry I've received from the Lord Jesus Christ. And in part, that ministry right now was to be sure that that offering got into the hands of the Jewish believers. So he goes on in verse 33. He says, hey, it's not about me. I, I, I'm willing to lose my life. It's not about me. I've not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing, he says in verse 33. And then he says something very interesting in verse 22. I'm on my way to Jerusalem, compelled by the Spirit. The very Spirit that warned him that it was going to be difficult is actually compelling him and driving him to go there. It would be almost like if someone knew you needed to go through something 
and said, I just want you to know it's not going to be easy. I'm not telling you not to go. I want you to know that when you go through it, don't be surprised when difficult things. He says, because I don't know what I will encounter there. But the very fact that Paul was bound, it's a perfect passive participle there, which may not mean much, but it carries the idea of this. In the past, there was a time when I was bound to the Lord Jesus Christ, and the result is still the same now. So it's a past action that the result continues even into the present. When was that? Paul's Damascus Road experience. What happened then? He came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he came to know Christ, it changed his life. He was born again. And, he, and when he was born again, it changed his life and his direction. All of a sudden, it was not Paul in the driver's seat, but it was God in the driver's seat. And so he was a bond servant of the Lord. And so he had no regard for his wants. Now, I'm not telling you this to say, hey, if you like Pringles potato chips, don't go home today and deny yourself Pringles potato chips. But I'm saying this, live your life with an awareness that you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. Live for God. Live for God. Paul did that. But I want you to see a final truth if, as far as Paul's example. And then quickly, we'll look at his exhortation. The fourth thing we see, Paul served with an understanding that these Ephesian people, they were not his, they were the Lord's. Paul invested three years of his life in Ephesus. He could have easily and selfishly said, listen to what I'm saying, follow me, do what I'm doing as the end all. No, he was always, even as an example, pointing them to Jesus Christ. Paul had a lot invested, but God had more invested. My favorite, one of my, well, my favorite prophetic chapter in in the Old Testament is uh, not, not in this uh, book. It's in Zechariah 14. But in Jonah, chapter 4 is my favorite narrative uh, chapter in the Old Testament. You may remember it. God had called Jonah to preach to Nineveh. And Nineveh uh, was a wicked city. And so Jonah was a reluctant prophet. And so early in the book of Jonah, instead of going uh, north and east where God wanted him to do, he headed south and west toward Tarsus. And you remember the story that the, the ship was tossed. His uh, fellow travelers cast him over the boat. He was uh, enveloped and swallowed by a large fish. And he had a lot of time to think. And so he was spewed out on the land, and Noah decided to do what God called him to do. And so he went and preached to Nineveh. But he didn't preach with a willing heart. He preached out of obedience. But the scripture says that after he preached to Nineveh, he sat outside of the city actually hoping what he had preached would not happen. He hoped that the people wouldn't repent. I can't think of a preacher that would be that way, but Noah was one of them. Could you imagine somebody preaching and preaching and then say, I hope nobody listens. I hope nobody responds. But that's where Nineveh was. He was sitting out this, on the side of the city hoping that he had done his task, but the people wouldn't respond, wouldn't repent, and would be judged. And so he sat there sort of looking and it was hot, and God provided a, vein, a vine. God has given him an object lesson. And the vine pr provided great shade for him. And Jonah was very happy. He was happy about the vine. See how Jonah is different from Paul? Jonah's thinking about his own comfort, not the kingdom of God. Paul was rejecting his own comfort, only focusing on the kingdom of God. And in this object lesson, one of the beautiful things we forget in the book of Jonah is how God is Lord of all creation. He sent a large fish, but just as importantly, in Jonah chapter 4, he sends a tiny worm to eat and begin to chew on that vine. And it, it takes the life out of that vine. And the scripture says that the sun came down and the vine withered and the sun began to beat down on Jonah's head. Now God had Jonah at a great time. He could learn a lesson. And so God said, Jonah, are you angry about this vine that's troubled? He said, I'm angry enough to die. And then God said this, this vine rose up in one day and died in a day. And by the way, not only is it so short term, but you did nothing, Jonah, to make that vine grow. 
Yet I created 120,000 people in Nineveh who don't know their right hand from their left, who will die and perish if they don't believe in me. And then he asked a question, should I not care about those people? Checkmate. God had him. God had him. What do we learn through all of that? They were God's people that he cared about. Created in his image. God's desire for them to be saved. Now, Paul wasn't like Jonah. He cared about the people. But he understood they weren't his people. They were God's people. And that kept him humble. Because if they were his people, he would have tried to build an empire. He would have tried to have grown a ministry of thousands and patted himself on the back and say, look at my following. It wasn't his following. It was God's following. And so we see the closing words in verse 32. We're almost finished today. Remember, he, he's saying his farewell. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all who are sanctified. In other words, he said, my ministry around you is a temporal ministry. But you are God's possession. You were given me as a sacred trust for three years. I poured myself, but I'm reminded you're not my people. You belong to God. And so whether we're teaching Sunday school or working with youth or leading a choir or serving in, in the pastoral ministry or whatever, we always need to be aware the people are not ours. They're God's people. It's a trust. Paul understood that. Well, real quickly, we see Paul's exhortation as a minister. He shared four clear things in his example, but there's one simple thing uh, in regard to exhortation, and it's this, beware of false teaching. And so look at what it says in verse 28. He says there, be on guard for yourselves, for all this flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you. Again, he was given a sacred trust. It was God's possession, but the Holy Spirit appointed the task that Paul had. And now he's sort of passing the baton to the Ephesian elders and he's saying, look, keep your head on a swivel. Protect the flock. Watch over those. Be on guard for all of the flock against what? Savage wolves is, is what's mentioned there. Um, savage wolves who will come in and disrupt the flock. Those savage wolves, that word savage carries the idea of placing undue burdens, which leads us to think probably legalism was being introduced here, that faith in Christ wasn't alone. He said, be careful of those people. And so he's saying, set an example as leaders of the flock. You know, if we're to follow those who profess Christ, it's important two things that must be sure. First is conduct. Uh, a minister must conduct himself. He's not going to be perfect. He's, he's not going to be without flaw, but he is to be above reproach. The conduct, follow, look at the lifestyle of the person who is leading. And that's what he's saying here. The second is creed. Be careful of what they're teaching. Because he mentions here uh, uh, deviant doctrines in verse 30. Beware of those who would bring deviant doctrines. These are crooked doctrines. I, one commentary I said mentioned it would be like pottery that was misshapen because it was in the hands of a clumsy worker. And so it's warning about these teachings that are awry. Listen, we are living in days, the Bible says, where there will be more and more of that than there's ever been. We're living in the last days. That's why when we turn on that television and we hear somebody say, just give $1,000 here and you'll be blessed with abundant homes and we get all excited about it, say, did Jesus live with abundant homes? Did Paul live with abundant homes? Beware of deviant doctrines because they can deceptively come in with an element of the truth and lead you into a place of destruction. So he said, watch out for the people. Watch out for the teachings. Be sure to embrace what is right. You know, Paul had a fruitful three years there. And he goes back here, really, as he looks at his life. It all started when he gave his life to Jesus Christ. That's when 
That's when he was bound. At that point, Paul meant what he said when he trusted Christ and he says here that I was, I was bound because of what the Lord has done for me. He was speaking to trusting Christ. I wonder today, have you trusted Christ? Because you cannot begin to serve God until you actually humbly repent of your sin and say, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe he, and I humbly say this, I believe he died for me and did for me what I can't do for myself. I wonder today, would you bind yourself under the Lordship of Jesus Christ? You can do that. If you've done it today, who's in control? If, if you profess Christ today, if you say, I know beyond the shadow of a doubt, I've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, at this moment, right now, who's in the captain's chair? Who's leading your life? God's spirit will work and convict, and he may say to you, you know, you, 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 you have professed Christ, you, you believe in me, but are you trusting me? Are you yielding? Today, maybe the decision you would make is, Lord, I want to yield my life like Paul, holy to you. However God leads, we're going to stand and sing in just a moment, but I want to close us in prayer and then we'll sing. Father, we thank you for the example of Paul, the exhortation of Paul. And Lord, as we have looked at his life today, Lord, he wasn't a perfect man. But Lord, he was a man who desired to follow you with all his heart, who at the end of his ministry to the Ephesians could say, I have no regrets that I have done what God has called me to do. Some people today maybe have never trusted Jesus Christ. They've heard about him. But Lord, they need to experience the life that is really life. I pray today they would say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I turn from my sin, I trust in you. Maybe there are others today who have done that and without a shadow of doubt know that they're in right standing with you as far as trusting Christ. But Lord, honestly would say, you know, God, I've been trying to take that wheel, take that seat my own life. Lord, may they yield to you. And we lift this prayer. 